Okay, um, here we are. We're in the home of Jennifer Palmer Lacey and her husband, who is not here at the time, but the noise in the background is from Jim, who is doing some work around the house. <laughs> Always doing some work Always around this house. Always doing some work around the house. <laughs> we are in uh, Charlie's old room, her son, um, and she'll tell us a little bit about that if, she's, if she feels like it. But uh, we are at, uh, what's the address? 2370 Silver Ridge Avenue. And we have just finished an interview across the street with uh, Ellen Jacobs and, and we want to interview this lady because she has a fascinating uh, history. And I'm going to start out by asking you where you were born. I was born in Norman, Oklahoma when my daddy was getting his PhD at the University of Oklahoma. And we lived there till I was about two and, and uh, then he got his first teaching job in Wichita Falls and we moved there. You know, we're going to have to close that door. That's probably a good idea. We're going to pick up a lot oh, of that. Oh, it's got a nice dress on it, too. Yeah, yeah. one of these days I'm going to do the trim. But, okay. <laughs> Focus, <laughs> JPL. Focus. Because <laughs> uh, uh, this, uh, this room was repainted to be what we called the magic room after Charlie was gone. But to get back to, um, I, I'm not from Texas, but I was raised in Texas. So that made it possible for me to have an accent like this that I could put on or take off whenever I please. And my mama was from uh, Arkansas, so she, she talked like this. And so I learned how to talk like my mama. And my daddy from Idaho had absolutely no accent at all, making it possible for me to be a radio personality like that. But at the time, I had this terrible lisp. From the time I was baby, I talk like that, nobody corrected me. So I taught my two sisters, and they had these terrible lisps, and all three of us had, had these lateral lisps, so you talk outside your mouth. And when my sister got into high school, she was very focused and corrected hers, and I didn't. And I went on to the radio, my other sister and I, <laughs> the Palmer sisters, you want Jennifer to tell us and what Laura, you're, what you're this was uh, around 1970. There, the radio station was blown up in 1969. Just there's but, pillows and everything. As a result of your being there? No, but <laughs> right after we were on the air, and that was a little bit, a little bit scary. Uh, in 19, the radio station had been sort of blown up twice. This is K KPFT Pacifica Radio in Houston. So wait, anyway, I grew up in Houston, went off to school in Idaho with my daddy's school, come back. And uh, I went to a meeting for the, for the radio station. and. They said they needed programming, and especially they needed programming that was not too left-wing because they had plenty of that. And so I said to my sister, who had this big record collection, why don't we do a show on 30s and 40s music? Nobody has ever even thought of doing that before. So we put together a little tape and we did that, but unfortunately we had not corrected our list yet. So it, the Palmer sisters, Jennifer and Laura, and, and, and we had an announcer who would say, the well, Palmer sisters are, will be with you in a minute. They'll dust off their 78s to bring you the best in vintage entertainment. And we used Harry James Seem to me. I've heard that song before. But when we'd get on the air, then we would say, well, well, Laura, what are we going to be doing today? Well, I think we'll take a sentimental journey back into the past. And we would sound like that. So our, record, our, our, our shows were played at WBAI once never ever played in California on the Pacifica stations because we didn't have the voice for it, which is odd because when you think of the Larmans, some people don't have the voice for it, Who but they the let Larmans? them play. Oh, the Larmans, they did the folk show on KPFK for years. And they, they talked like they were straight out of the Bronx or something and terrible voices, terrible, but they knew everybody and they managed to get on the air. Also, they sounded like a lot of the people who listen to Pacific Radio when it comes down to it, you know. These New York left-wing people, but that's okay. There's a, there's a place for all of that. So nevertheless, what happened? How did I get to California? I know you want to know. Well, I was on Pacifica Radio for about nine, ten years and started off with the Palmer Sisters, and then there was a strike, and I was a strike breaker, which is an evil thing to have to relate. But I always wanted to do the morning show, and everybody else was striking. So I got on the morning show, and immediately killed the lisp. Didn't have a lisp ever again because I was a new character. And I decided to call myself Mandy in the morning 
from the song Old Man Depression, You Are Through, You've Done Us Wrong, and I was doing a lot of 30s and 40s stuff still. Then I was on the air, I was Mandy in the morning for several years at Pacifica, and um, then I met my husband, Doug, when he moved into our neighborhood. Now, we the neighborhood we lived in in Houston was called the Montrose, and it was where all the artsy people, the musicians, and so forth lived. Now, I, I put people to sleep, so don't... But, I mean, <laughs> anyway, the artsy people, and, and I was on the radio from 6 to 9 in the morning, and nobody was awake except people who had to go to work, and, and so most of the radio station personnel didn't even know what I was doing at that time of the morning. It was great. It was great. I could do anything. I could play Symphony Fantastique if I wanted to. I could just pff, anything I wanted. So anyway, I did that for about eight or nine years, and we went through a bunch of different managers, and at one point I was cut off the air, and um, it was a terrible, terrible situation. But they brought me back because I was the most popular programmer because uh, anybody could listen to me in the morning, and there were people awake in the morning, which most of the people at Pacifica weren't aware of. So anyway, I was on there for a while, and I met my husband when he uh, moved into this neighborhood, this artsy neighborhood called the Montrose, where there were folk singers and painters and just all kinds of people living in there because the rent was cheap. And I lived in a house with two other people to start out. Actually, one to start out with, then two. And I only had the, the downstairs part on Dennis Street. And... Um, it was right in the heart of all this stuff. Everybody walked or bicycled everywhere. Hardly anybody had cars. And this was around mid-70s. And we didn't play any music like everybody was playing in the mid-70s. We didn't, we didn't play the Carpenters and that kind of stuff. We, we mostly played people like, um, like Ry Cooter and uh, Bonnie Ray and Linda Ronstadt. That was our sort of our, our typical... And we knew a lot of the artists that were there because they would perform in the local clubs. And I remember when Bruce, Bruce Springsteen came to town. That changed my life because I, I had to wear glitter socks then and I had to wear tight clothes and my, roll up my jeans and everything. I, I had to look for if he ever came to town again. <laughs> I was ready. But, but it was people like that that were just starting out and, and they would play the local clubs and you'd get to see Billy Joel before he was big. So that was kind of what I came from, and Doug moved into that group about 74, 75. He took, I was going to move in with this other announcer named Captain Macho. You know, this big, beautiful acres of land in the middle of that part. Of but instead my husband moved in because he had a keyboard, and Macho was a very manipulative fellow, and so he got my husband to move in and got to use his keyboard. When did you get married? Um, well, after we came here, and in uh, you nineteen, weren't, you weren't married at the time that he moved in. No, well, no, that's okay. You're, you could tell me that. No, no, it, it, there was so much of this that that people would find a house for one hundred and twenty-five dollars a month, and then in order for it, us to swing the rent, there'd have to be four, three or four people living in the various rooms of the house. And I was living with another announcer and a guy who worked for the telephone company who had been my boyfriend in high school. So that's the kind of arrangements we had, you know, kind of like people have now with not much money. Here. Well, e e yeah, in, right here in Silver Lake, in Echo Park particularly, uh, and in and, and the Alan Morris buildings because there's like they have three bedrooms and they'll have three different people, just like Alan was saying. So anyway, what happened was that he, Doug, Doug got called by Hollywood and all of my life I wanted to go to Hollywood. I was crazy about my favorite actress was Ann Baxter, and I knew she had moved to Hollywood, and I wanted to be there. I, oh, I didn't know much about other things. I knew Charlton Heston lived there, who was also one of my favorites, and Vincent Price, and most of them lived in Hollywood. I wanted to know them. Why did I want to know them? Because of the Ten Commandments. Because I saw the Ten Commandments and fell in love with everybody in the Ten Commandments, and I had to come to Hollywood so I could know some of these people. So Doug went off to Hollywood, and... Um, and I stayed in Texas with my job and everything. And he won the Gong Show. This was 1977. He won the Gong Show, and they it was on the air, and everybody in, in Montrose showed up in this television and watched them win the Gong Show and playing uh, the Stars and Stripes Forever with steel drums and trombones and stuff and wearing weird outfits. And Chuck Barris loved them, and oh, that was great, you know. 
So once they won the gong show, they got $562, and they just happened to find a band house that they could move into for $500, first and last month's rent, and so they did, and it was right next to the Forum in Inglewood. So I came out, they, they put out the call that uh, the band house needed women. Now, I, I didn't realize they put out this call to a lot of people, but I was going with Doug for a couple of years before this, so I was kind of like, okay. So I ended up coming out, and got a job in advertising and graphics and um, I was out for uh, I was here for about six months when I got pregnant with Charlie so we ended up getting married in 1979 Charlie was born in 1980 and the band house spoke up we had no place to go the lady who owned the house decided that we kept it so nice that she wanted it she took it back so the band was disseminated, and the band was called the Montrose Marching Band. We still kept the Montrose name. But by the time we left that house, we were called Chili's, just plain Chili. And it was a steel drum band with, um, um, I played the accordion, and um, we had a drummer, and uh, Jim was a guitar player. So the guy who works on our house, worked on the house, every house we've ever had. He, he does that on the side. So. Nonetheless, we went looking for a place to live and ended up in a little bungalow in Hollywood. Well, I had a house in Houston. The house was sold. I got $10,000 profit off the house, and I needed to invest in something here because the government would take your money. Uh, they would charge you capital gains on your money if you didn't invest it immediately into another house. So I started driving around looking for a place, and there was this little tiny blue very bizarre looking house right on Glendale Boulevard. It was not a normal house. It was not square. It was shaped like the state of Nevada. It had like a point to it and the point conformed to Glendale Boulevard. And it had been built in 1908 and whoever was selling it was selling it for $65,000 uh, and he had bought it for 37 who somebody who had bought it for 18, somebody who had bought it for 9. And, and that's within the last 10 or 15 years. The prices had gone whap, whap, whap like that. Well, we lived in this house. It was very historic. It had been built in 1908, and a man lived there for, who worked for the city for years and years and years, and during the Depression, he would make beans for people, and he'd invite ho people that were hungry in, and they'd get them a pot of beans, you know, a bowl of beans. And then for a while, it was owned by a couple, and the, the guy we bought it from was a man named Krauss, who was... Uh, he had just fixed it up, supposedly. And I had gotten so tired of trying to fix up the house in Houston that I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to fix up this house. This house is already done. It's got the wallpaper. It's got the new floor. It's got... Well, it was kind of papered over a bunch of holes. And we didn't find that out until much later. And he had this beautiful gray carpet which showed dirt immediately as soon as you moved in. But we, we didn't know. This was our first real house. The other one had belonged to a blind lady and <laughs> it was in terrible shape because she couldn't see there was anything wrong with it, you know. So I had spent like two summers trying to get it fixed up nicely. So anyway, we moved into this house on Glendale Boulevard, which was in Silver Lake, right over the hill from the lake. You just go over Cove Street steps and there you were. There was a grocery store within walking distance there weren't a bunch of bums and prostitutes like there were in Hollywood. It was just so refreshing. This neighborhood was so refreshing. And everything was beautiful. There were flowers everywhere. And even though we were right on Glendale Boulevard and the cars were just whoosh, 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 all the time, it was still amazing. So we moved in there and then we built a log cabin there on Glendale Boulevard. Why did we end up with a log cabin? Because I couldn't figure out how to build a Frank Lloyd Wright house on a substandard lot. <laughs> I, actually, by that time, I was a docent at the Hollyhock House and the Ennis Brown House. And I was trying to figure out how I could build a concrete block house that would look really nice on this 43-foot wide lot, 70 foot by 43, and 50 at the bottom. So instead, we went to Idaho, and I saw a whole subdivision of log cabins. And I thought, we can do this is Lincoln Log time. Not knowing that Frank Lloyd Wright's son had invented the Lincoln Logs, but that's where I got the idea. Lincoln Logs. So, was, so when I found that out, it was like, hey, of course, this is a Wright house, isn't it? Because it's like, you know, just put it together. 
So we did that. <laughs> we did. <laughs> we built it. We built this log cabin, and all of my modern friends, all of my hollyhock house docent friends, were like, "Ooh, you built a log cabin. That is so. Oh, that's so yesterday. What? Why not? Why not? Why didn't you get a good architect and build it? You, know, you know, look at the case study house. Get some ideas." And so I, I you know, I was feeling bad about it, and uh, I asked John Lautner because he was at one of our festivals. We did these festivals in Runyon Canyon. And I asked him, you know, everybody's giving me a hard time because I built a log cabin. He goes, log cabin? Well, I built a log cabin. First house I ever built was a log cabin up in Michigan for my mom. My mom designed it and I helped build it. And I was only 15 years old. Nothing wrong with a log cabin, he says. And so I was like, all right. <laughs> approval from a legit I got, I got, I got approval from the man. I, I you know, admired my, I have to say, Lautner was more the minute I moved to Silver Lake, I knew I was in the right place because there was a Lautner house on the whole top of this hill, and I could just paint it and paint it, paint it all I wanted. Silver top. Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 the first painting I ever did had silver top in it, and dinosaurs in the lake. But that was that's a okay. Period. Probably they were there at one time. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we built this house, and uh, uh, Charlie was seven years old, and I was working at a decent job that had insurance and I said if I'm going to have another baby I better do it now while I can still pay for it. <laughs> so I got pregnant with Laura and uh, she was she was born while I still had insurance and then all the I was working for an accounting firm and they all merged and laid off half the half their uh, staff. I was in the art department not a particularly important department in an accounting firm so they laid off half the art staff. But before they could do that, I had Laura, and she was Dr. Mack from, who, you know, went to went to Marshall and lived in the neighborhood, been here for years. He was everybody's pediatrician. He was everybody's delivering person. So it was great. She had great prenatal care and everything, where Charlie, you know, we were living in a band house, and it was a little iffy. But... Then we, that meant that there was this one bedroom house with us that's sleeping in the living room, and we put Charlie in the. I mean, we put Laura. We put Laura in the utility room, and with the refrigerator and the washing machines, and it was not enough room. So we started looking around. Even with the log cabin, the log cabin was just for a studio. So I had my studio on the top, the sky and other wonders. Doug had his studio on the bottom, and most of the time his studio was so full I couldn't walk up to my studio, because it's still that way. He's very uh, acquisitive. He's acquisitive. But his studio is much nicer now. Maybe we can look at it. Anyway, so we moved to another, we looked for another place, and right around the corner there was another house for sale. And our house with the log cabin was now worth a, twice as much as we paid for it. So we sold it for 149000 We bought the other place for one fifty five, and it was a two-bedroom house. And the kids had to share a room, but Laura was a baby. She was in corner in a crib and Charlie had like a uh, bunk beds that, that he could have his friends over and he could play on the one underneath. And so it was it was really nice and that was on Oak Glen Place where the road goes over the freeway. Over the two? Uh, on the two freeway and Oak Glen Place is on both sides of it. It's a very short street. So you moved about a half a mile uh, I, We moved two blocks away. Two blocks, okay. And we didn't sell the house for quite a while, so I was having art shows in it, and I, I had a really pretty successful one. Sold over at, at the time over a thousand dollars worth of stuff. That was good for me. So uh, that was the first sky and other wonders that log cabin, and it was bought by the. By the. Um, Bravo boys, okay. These two boys, Jaime Bravo and. I can't remember the other one, but they, these two boys, their grandmother had just sold a big house in Los Feliz because the prices were going way up, and she had like a five hundred thousand dollars so house way now. Back up a second. Yeah. Two brothers. One was Jaime Bravo. Ha Jaime Bravo, and I can't remember the other one. But they had they had Hispanic names. Their their father was Hispanic, but their mother was uh, the daughter of this lady who had a really nice place in Los Feliz, and that was when the market went up again. So they sold their place, and she had like. Three hundred thousand dollars, and she said, "Okay, one hundred and forty-nine thousand. That's a bargain," and bought the log cabin and the 
house for the Bravo boys, and one of the Bravo boys had just gotten married. He immediately gutted it, put the living room in a different place and the bedroom in a different place and everything, and it was nice for them. But we moved into this little Spanish-style house. <laughs> the people that had it before us were 85 years old, and their their children wanted them to come and live with them in um, Stanis... San, mm, up, North, up in the north. Northern California. Yeah, Northern California. And they felt, they, they were worried about them because they were 85 years old and, and this, this lot was really steep and they would be going up and down doing their gardening and they were afraid that one of them was going to fall, something terrible was going to happen. And when we cleaned out the place, we found out one of the reasons was that they also owned an apartment building uh, that was named after them. Um, and it's still it's still there. It's an Echo Park. It's still named after them. Um, it'll come to me. But they they had taken every every shower door, every piece of equipment that had been thrown out of that house, and they used it to landscape the gardens. So they had like shower door landscaping, and they attempted to put a pool pool in for fish, but they weren't very good at it, you know. And it so it was all this just seat of your pants, um, do-it-yourself type of stuff in the yard. And we found that out after we bought the place. There were like four loads of garbage that were put out in the front of the... That was when they would take anything you put out. And, and it, all those screen... All those uh, shower doors and everything. Um, they were from Malta. The man was from Malta. Married a nurse that he met in the war. Brought her back and they had lived in that house since the, like the... 50s or 60s and anyway so so we lived in that house for six years and I remember standing in the middle of that house and thinking to myself I'm going to be here for six years and no longer and my friend who's um, a painter too Barry and Pacillus and I used to take these walks where would we walk up here where it's even more wonderful so we would walk up here and then we would climb up the steps and then we would go down Hidalgo right past the Wright's house you know Rupert Pohl's house, and that was our little route that we would take. Well, one day we were walking by this house, and somebody had cut down some trees in front of it because they were going to sell it. They, there wasn't a sign out front yet. There was nothing. And while we were looking at the house, Therian's old boyfriend, Dave Patler, came up and said, they're going to put this house on the market any minute. And I was like, oh, I love this house. I always loved this house back from when you could just see one window of it because it was totally covered up by these big cypress trees and 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 now that you could really see it and you could see the panes in the windows and you could see the turret and you oh my gosh this was beautiful so he arranged for us to get into the house and I walked around in the house and I sat on the steps out there on the inside of the turret and I said I've got to live in, this has got to be my house I've got to have this house and I was a goddess at the time <laughs> And we burned candles for things. Let's see, when was this? 90s? Yeah, early 90s. Me and these other goddesses all got in a circle and we called the directions. And we called in the powers of the goddess and I said, I want to get that house. And sure enough, the goddesses made it happen. <laughs> we even went to the right land. That was my, one of my first trips to the right land, was to to do goddess things. They have goddess things. That they still have goddess things at the right land. They do all kinds in of stuff. Malibu. In Malibu, yeah, at the right land. So with all of that power focused toward getting this house, we managed to get the house. And it was going to cost us 160, I think it was 162000 But by the time they said, well, you need a new roof and you need a new heating system, it's all rusted out. The house is set empty for 15 years. And the story behind it is... Do you have time for that? The story behind this house is more exciting than anything about the house. Well, the house was built in 1926, lived in for a very short time. The Depression came, and it was moved into by a guy named Hopper and his wife, Ethel Georgette Hopper, and he lived here for about 20 years, and he was much older than her. He was an electrician. He did electricity contracting out of the garage. The garage was never used for a car because they had horses. They had a stable down below and there were all these legends that this was part of the mix estate and that maybe this was an advisor's house or something like that, a producer's house or something that he didn't live in this house but 
a lot of the houses around here were built for Tom Mix and his relatives. And like they were saying, the little houses up on, on uh, uh, Cove were built for uh, crew, so forth. He planted trees up at the top of this house. I had a whole forest up at the top of this house, uh, on this hill. So there's a good chance that it might be true. Nonetheless, uh, they lived in this house until the 40s, and the barn burned down. And they rebuilt the barn in 1947, so the man was still alive at that time. His name was Harold Hopper. An interesting name. And so uh, they had the horses, and, and they had the two lots on either side, which uh, Ethel would ride horses down the lots, and she was worried that the lots were too steep, and she began to collect debris from when somebody would break up a sidewalk or when somebody would be building a building. She had a little red wagon and she would bring it in and she would put the debris on the down the side of the house so that it would level out the land a little bit. And whenever anybody was uh, excavating for a new home, and this was one of the first houses on the block, people would, she'd say, just dump it down in there. And then she could get up and down with her horse easier if there was some, some fill. So a lot of the land in here is filled. Not also, uh, when the street was put in, just before the house was put in, they put some things to hold up the street because it was this was a ravine. It was much deeper, so they put all of this concrete uh, stuff in, and so the lot in between us and Brisky's house, which is the new one they were talking about with the tires, uh, it holds up the street. Someone bought that lot. Whether they can do anything with it or not, I don't know because they'd have to be sure to hold up the street. So nonetheless, uh, the, the husband died and this lady kept cats. Cats everywhere. And she saved newspapers. And the whole house was so full of stuff that when her nephew would come over to visit, which he did sometimes, she couldn't let him in the house. They would play in the yard of the two, the two parts of the house. They would go to the stable, you know, but I don't know whether they still had horses or not, but it had been rebuilt in 1947. And then again it burned down some time in the 60s. And uh, when that happened, it became an eyesore and a neighborhood nuisance. And it took 10 years for them to manage to get the city to decree that it had to be torn down. Well, she was still living here up until the 80s. And the children down below on Lakeview that we knew some of the children were saying, this was a crazy lady, this crazy lady. What had happened was that sometimes she had decided to burn the newspapers that she had collected in her fireplace. She set the house on fire and it burned up one corner of the house. We were still digging out charcoal when we moved in and uh, she couldn't live in the house because the fire department told her she couldn't live in the house until she made repairs. And she couldn't figure out how to make repairs because her husband had died and he did all the Financial stuff. She would. She had owned a bunch of little rent houses in Frogtown. She'd get the checks. She'd just put them, stack them up. She never really knew how he did it. <laughs> and so the, the thought that she was crazy was possibly true. She was grieving for her husband, and her husband had said, I've got two plots for us up there at Forest Lawn, and if I go before you, you can always look out over Forest Lawn and see the cross, and there I am, so I'll never leave you. So she just quietly lost her mind. And um, anyway, she lived in one of these two lots. Actually, that one over there, she had been throwing out jade plants for years, and they were six, eight feet tall, and she lived behind the jade plants. Come and go to the bathroom, maybe cook, but that's it, you know. She couldn't live in the house. The fire department told her she couldn't live in the house. And even though she had the money to fix it, she didn't know how. So what happened was, one day she was out with her little red wagon, and the little red wagon cut loose and broke her leg. And she had to go into the hospital. She never really recovered from it. Okay, she had left all of her property to her sister, the one that was the mother of the the nephew and the, the they were school teachers. The sister died within a few months of her dying. So the whole thing was up in probate for 15 years, just sitting there with the termites chewing away at it. So when we finally got it, uh, there was a lot of things wrong. We thought we were buying this beautiful house. The first day it rained, rain was leaking in the inside of the living room. The, there, there were, it was just riddled 
with with holes and we've never completely fixed that it's almost impossible to find every place that you need to fix without having to gut it and tear it down some guy was ready to gut it and tear it down it was yellow tagged it was right after the 93 earthquake and we moved in with it yellow tagged replaced a porch which is what they really wanted the porch was falling off and that's how we got this castle so we've been living in the castle since 1995. We've not always lived in the castle, but since 95. Charlie's room was the first room that was done because we were still trying to sell the house on Oak Glen Place. So Charlie came up and lived here by himself for several months for his birthday in 95, I guess. He was going to Marshall. I have uh, painted his room for him and made it so he could move up here and he could stay at the house. And he, he was thrilled to be by himself, of course, 15 years old by himself. And he rode his bicycle to Marshall every day. From here? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, and he, he would have to walk it up. Oh, but he'd have he, to walk up, yeah. yeah. But, but the rest of the way he rode the bicycle. So uh, he, um, was, he was a barrister and for a while he went to the zoo school in Griffith Park because he was a magnet school student all of the time he was growing up. It's, uh, he had had an unfortunate thing happen he was going to CES and he was never going to have to go to a different school, Center for Enriched Studies, because they go all the way through high school. And some uh, science teacher had let him clean out her closet and he found a box of matches. And he lit a match in the auditorium during assembly and he was kicked right out of there and not allowed back in the magnet program, just went straight to King. And at the time, King was a school where the Armenians and the uh, Hispanics fought constantly. And he was a white kid and both, both of them picked on him. Hmm. So he, we didn't realize how bad it was. But back then, people thought hey, bullying is part of life. You get, you know, that's what you put up with. Never thought there was anything wrong with somebody being bullied. That was how you learned to defend yourself, so forth and so on. But he was pretty severely bullied, and so he got out of King and he went to uh, Marshall, and then he went to the zoo school for a while. Um, but he decided he wanted to go to the downtown business magnet, which he thought. He could learn computers. He got there and nobody knew any more comp about computers than he did. So he fell behind because that was mainly a trade school. Got back, tried, tried to go to the zoo school and they said, well, you're not keeping up with us. Go back to Marshall. That's your home school and that's where he ended up in Marshall. He graduated from Marshall. That At that time, uh, there were a lot of recruiters on campus. It wasn't against the law like it is now. And the Marines recruited him when he was 17 and put him into a program. We didn't even know he was in it. Made him go to Narcotics Anonymous because he smoked marijuana sometimes. Wanted him to get completely clean for the Marines. And uh, he was all set to go into the Marines. And I was like, are you sure you want to do this, Charlie? He had an IQ of 135. He was very intelligent. But no, he always wanted to be a Marine. And his friends were going into the Marines. So, okay. So we went along with that. and. Just as he was getting ready to go into the Marines, the Air Force called up and said, he has the highest uh, intelligence test of anybody that we've ever tested, and we want him to test for the Air Force, the elite squad. And so it, it, his father said, okay, go ahead, let's go ahead and do that. And he, the Air Force just like snapped him up, and the Marines were mad because they put a lot of time into getting him ready and getting him clean and so forth, and which they considered smoking marijuana. was, Of course, the, once you get over there, Everybody's going to be smoking marijuana. I don't know what the problem was with that. But anyway, he had to be clean for, for basic training. And so uh, the Air Force wanted it. Well, that pushed his enlistment date up, his induction date up, another three or four months. During that time, he began to think about what he was doing and getting into the military. And he began to be worried about it. He began to give his things away, which we didn't think much of at the time because, you know, you're supposed to put away childish things and become a man and so forth. And he went into the basic training and he didn't make it. That he was he was a very trusting, loving child. He wasn't very hard nosed and somebody asked him if he was having problems, he says, Yes I am and they put him in the psychiatric unit and decided he was insane. Because he was having nightmares. And when he held a gun he thought about how he could use it to kill himself. Because he was that kind of a person who thought a lot. Well, and then, anyway, they kicked him out. And he came back. He was in the Conservation Corps for a while, 
and he went to he went off to school. He went to LACC, and they kept canceling classes on him, and he was looking for something better. So he ended up going to Copper Mountain College in Joshua Tree. And he was, seemed to be doing fine out there. He, he was quiet and nice out there, you know, calm out there. We thought that's what he needed. But uh, at some point he made a deal with, he, he had been spending all his college money too fast and he made a deal with some friends to buy magic mushrooms. And he would sell them, he would make back doubled his money and this, but he was not very good at that kind of thing and he ended up taking most of them and that uh, sort of like chemically altered him so that he was, there were some things wrong then, you know. Before that we, we couldn't have told that there was, maybe he was depressed, we didn't think that was important. Back then is something you grew out of, okay. So anyway, what happened to Charlie was that he got more and more um, mentally ill and I was lucky I had Kaiser I was a teacher I'd started being a teacher so we took Charlie he was having stomach aches we thought it was just you know something organic something's wrong with him get him some medicine but they put him into the mental facility and started dr drugging him the way they do nowadays instead of trying to find out what's really wrong with you they look for a drug that's going to work because that's and he got worse and worse and worse, and eventually he killed himself in the desert. And um, we, I was on my way up there to take, to spend another summer with him, like I had the summer before. And I guess he didn't want to have somebody taking care of him anymore, feeling like I had to make sure that you take your medication and all this stuff because it wasn't really. I don't think it really was doing him a lot of good to take it. So this was how, his room. How old was he? 23. 23. He was 23. The, the first signs that there was anything wrong uh, were when he was like, it happened so fast. Uh, the, the Christmas he was 21, just before he turned 22. So it, it, even though he, there had been attempts, suicide attempts before, it was like I'm taking all my Benadryl or something like that. And we didn't want him to have a record of having been suicidal, and so we intervened and said, oh, well, it, he had hurt his knee and he didn't, he overdosed accidentally, that kind of thing. We were protecting him. Mm -hmm. So all of that was when I started teaching, and I was teaching at Elysian Heights. Before that, I was an extra for a while, and like I said, I was a commercial artist, production artist for a long time, and Douglas was a musician. He's been a musician, never had to do anything else. Got some commercials. Um, he had a Zydeco band that was pretty much of a going deal for about five years before the fiddle player got into a fight with somebody and they split up. Her band's still doing great, but she took all the gigs and she she was the person person booking people. So, so he still does that. He played county fairs, played the um, L.A. County Fair, played Lawrence County Fair. Uh, plays the accordion. He, he got the accordion. He started playing the accordion because I was supposed to start at the first Cajun band in L.A. with my friend Clyde Woodward, who was a good old boy and quite the wheeler dealer, and came out with Lucinda Williams, but they fought the whole way. And when he got here, he was going to start this Zydeco band, and he, I was the only one he knew played the accordion, so he gave me a tape to listen to, and I was supposed to learn all the songs. Well, then I got pregnant with Laura, and I couldn't play the accordion anymore, so I said, Doug, you take over, and of course, Doug's anything to play music and not have to do, you know, nine-to-five job. So he took over, and he made a going concern out of it, and I never really had to play the accordion again, except for fun. And I still have, I keep my accordions you had to play it for us? I could play the accordion. What do you want to hear? Huh? Whatever you want to play. Well, okay, when I was in school, when I was teaching, that that accordion was the one I would use. But Douglas took the straps off of it. The little one. What, what is the name of that? That's a little Chinese accordion. That's that's like a, a children's accordion in China. Can you imagine? Get it. Yeah, both of our both of my accordions are red, and I have another one that's red. They're all red. I want to show I, I can't get up. I'm trapped behind the tripod. Okay. There's this little accordion down there on the floor. Yeah, and it's just oh, got like an octave and a half, and you can teach children how to... So I was teaching a couple of my students how to play the accordion on that. And uh, when I was at Elysian Heights, 
and I taught second grade and then I moved to kindergarten and then we had um, lost a lot of teachers. I can't pull back on this. Okay, um, so do you want me to move over here? Yeah, good, good, yeah, because then I can get... And then you can see this extremely attractive painting of The, the landscape Glendale. of uh, Glendale, <laughs> yes, across the canyon. Yeah, I, I, I did that probably in the 80s when I was fascinated by it because it looked like a swastika to me, and um, that's a typical artist impression. You're not a Nazi, are you? No. Just checking. No. No. And that is a picture of the house overlooking Fairfax. That is a really oh, up on the top of the hill. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've been curious yeah. about that house. Do you know, who, who uh, a guy named O'Brien designed it, and I met him briefly. And he said if I ever finished it, he'd buy it. But I never finished it, partly because in order to take, I have to take it up there uh, to Sierra Bonita and sit with the canvas leaned against the back of my car. Uh, and if it's hot or if it's windy or anything like that, it makes it really difficult to... I When I paint plain air, I paint plain air. Like, I was at Grand Tetons to do that. I had to go to Grand Tetons to do that painting. And um, everything that I do is, is pretty much plain air. So I'm, I'm getting to the point where I can almost work from photographs, but the spirit of the place is not there when you work from photographs. You have to be there. And that's just kind of the way I... In other words, you're not a copyist. Yeah, I have a hard time with that. So, um, yeah, I write songs too, but, but we never get much out of them. You want me to play one I wrote? Play one you can sing to. Okay. Most of the, mostly I play at the uh, Joshua Tree Saloon open stage night. Before that, I was at the Bull Hand. <laughs> Hands number two open stage night in Houston, Texas, and that's about it. Let's see if I can songs that I learned when I was little like you know like this land is your land and you can teach the kids that stuff they love it they eat it up and, uh, so anyway that's about the, all the accordion I do but my husband is a pirate at Disneyland and he plays all the sea shanties plus yo ho yo ho a pirate's life for me we kindle and char and flame and ignite and go be hearties yo ho that kind of stuff I tried out to be a, a, a pirate myself but then they weren't hiring any more pirates. <laughs> they didn't get to do it. But I, I, you know, I could do some of those things too. So that's uh, that's the accordion, and the accordion has been very, very good to us. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs> you know, we've had we've had other people we've interviewed play for us. Uh, Marion Spencer played the piano for uh -huh. us at her place up on Mitchell Terrena. We had a fellow I can't think of his name, Jim. Uh, he played flamenco guitar for us. Oh, uh huh. And who else has played besides you? Um, pretty soon we could have a whole band: <laughs> piano, accordion, and uh, guitar. Who yeah, knows? Yeah. Well, you know, I should tell Douglas's story a little bit because he came from the same. It's very weird. 
Uh, we didn't know each other at all. We lived within three blocks of each other when we were children in Bel Air, Texas. And uh, he went to a different school on the other side of Houston that was exactly... The, they, they made these cookie-cutter schools um, early 60s. And they were two stories, or maybe, no, three. There were three stories, all the classrooms in a line, just a big box, sort of what we would call international style. But nonetheless, that's what they were. And they had a, a, a stairway at one end and a stairway at the other end and no elevators. And so he, he, was, he grew up basically with the same kind of school that I went to. Went to University of Texas. I only went for like a month and found out that I, they wanted me to stay for another three years and there was no way because I already, I already had my 69 units and I only needed to be there for a year and a half. So uh, uh, University of Texas was that way. They wanted you to stay there as long as possible because their tuition was very low and it helped their economy to have 70,000 people in Austin at any one given time. So anyway, he went to that school and, and we ended up only meeting in the Montrose because he was, by the way, seven years younger than I am. And uh, when we did finally uh, get together, I was trying to learn how to sing out of a microphone without popping it, you know. <laughs> and he knew how to do that. And um, I had a band. I never had bands with more than two or three people in them. And my, my first band was called the Dennis Street Saints. And it was me and my high school boyfriend who played the drums. It was a Zydeco band, and we would stay up late at night practicing, and the next-door neighbors were from, from El Salvador or something, and they loved hearing the accordion, and they would sit there at the kitchen table just like this until we finished. It would be like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. So one day, uh, Doug came over, and uh, we had this very terrible piano, but he had turned, learned to be a piano tuner. That's what he's really famous for. In a piano tuner. And he learned it from the guy I was going to move in with, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, so Doug, so Doug is a piano tuner. He tuned this piano, and, and we, uh, by, my uh, high school boyfriend had moved into his own house, which was probably a good thing. And uh, he had a lawyer lady, and we invited the lawyer lady over to his house one time. And my high school boyfriend, talk about clutter. He's one of these people with the paths through it, you know? And and so he had moved everything he had into this little tiny house in Houston. And the and so, long story short, we got the lawyer drunk. And when people were drunk, we sounded half-assed okay. <laughs> well, it's not you did anyway. <laughs> but, well, we could convince her that, you know, that we sounded half-assed okay. And she said, I'll hire you for this big party we're having at the local, uh, the, uh, it was kind of like a upscale uh, bar folk club. Theodore's. It was called Theodore's. Theodore's 19th Century Fox. It was period. <laughs> this was like in the mid-70s. So anyway, <laughs> we get ready to, for this gig and we're like, we're terrible. We're terrible. What are we going to do? I can't even say it on a microphone. So <laughs> so we hired Doug and Doug Wait, brought in this... Explain that phrase, sing out of the microphone. Well, I, 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 I was afraid of the microphone. Uh -huh. I was afraid I would pop it, and I would go off key, and I, I was not used to being... I was a disc jockey, but I had earphones on. Right. I knew what I was doing, but when I was, when I was um, trying to sing, I couldn't hear myself. You know, and I know people have monitors and everything like that, but I didn't, I didn't really understand any of that, and I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't so terrible, that I was off key and everything. So, so anyway, uh, he, he showed up. Uh, Doug showed up and he had amplifiers and he had a keyboard and we pulled it off, ba barely. Because my mother taught me to sing like Brenda Lee with the little... Uh, 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 uh. Took me years to get over that. And Douglas wouldn't, wouldn't let me sing. You know, I could do background, but I couldn't. You know. So anyway, so we got through it. And, and after that, Doug and I got to be more, uh, you know... Like closer to each other because he was really young, you know. I thought he was, oh. and I was a big star on Pacifica Radio. Everybody knew Mandy in the morning, you know. <laughs> I had that kind of thing, and I did. I had fans. I had people that would bring me things, that would give me things. One guy just uh, came to visit me in the studio and didn't like my shoes, and and brought me these high heeled pumps because he thought I should be wearing 
more sexy shoes, things like that. As if it mattered when you were in the studio. In the studio, it didn't make a yeah. dang bit of difference. <laughs> That's funny. So anyway, it, <laughs> you'd, get, you'd get some, and people would call up and give you requests, you know, that kind of thing, you know, and, it, and you kind of got a little bit of a, a little bit of an ego going, but never an awful lot, because the cool thing about being on the radio, nobody cared how you looked. And, and it, sometimes people would say, oh, uh, uh, you want to go out to dinner, and they would be disappointed because I would have brown eyes instead of blue or something like that. It wasn't what they envisioned. So I kind of just kept, kept back from a lot of that, and being on the air, it was great, and I could tell stories. I mean, the only problem was you didn't want any dead air. You didn't, you didn't want to not be talking unless you had something queued up and, you know, and so forth. So I got into the habit of not allowing dead air in my life, and it's not probably necessary. And Douglas just tunes it out. He goes to sleep sometimes. Puts him <laughs> right to sleep. <laughs> so he came out here, and then I followed out here, and we've been here ever since, pretty much. Oh, I have to say for the record that I've, you've never impressed me as a talkative lady. When the times I've known you, of course, it's been in a class where you sat quietly and listened True. like the rest of us. And then you read your wonderful uh, Travels Without Charlie, which is a, another subject, but just as a footnote to this interview. Uh, both Jennifer and I share a senior writing class, life history writing class at the Griffith Park Adult Community Center, and she wrote a wonderful, better than a travelogue, but an adventure uh, based on John Steinbeck's book, Travels with Charlie, which was about uh, travels around North America with his little black poodle, and she wrote one uh, about uh, recreating that trip without her son. And it was very touching, and it, it can probably be found someplace if you're at all interested. Those it's a blog. It's a blog. It's a blog. <laughs> so, uh, with that said, I'm sorry to mean to interrupt. No, that's uh, that's fine. And, and I, I mainly went into that class to kind of go over that that narrative and 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 kind of fine tune it so I can eventually add what needs to be added to it to to make a book out of it. And it's been, it was very useful. I'm having a hard time getting back there because now I know how hard it is for everybody to write something every week and have it ready to read because the Travels Without Charlie had been written basically in, in, in real time. And since it's, an only, it's only a 33-day trip, it took me less than two months to write the whole thing. And it was being done as a blog, and blogs make you stick to the real date. So uh, it, it, it took me less than two months to write, to write it, and then I went back over it once and uh, tweaked it a little bit, but now I have to do that again. I have a short story I've been working on since 1969, is which is still, almost is ready. Is it still short? <laughs> it, well, you know, I, I, I haven't counted the words, but I would say it's about in, the, in what you would call a short story length. But I've never, I haven't, I've got it up on the computer now. I've never been satisfied enough to send it out anywhere. That's, a, that's where the idea of the sky and other wonders comes from. The sky and other wonders, it's a fiction story, so I wouldn't be taking it to the life writing. But it, it was a Volkswagen van. It was my dream to have a Volkswagen van that I could travel all over the country. This was everybody's dream in the 60s, I think. Yeah. I travel all over the country and kind of like the guys on Route 66 where you'd go into a town and you'd get a, a, a job uh, clerking in a store for a couple of months and you'd have enough money to live on and that kind of thing. But my Volkswagen van was going to be an art Volkswagen van and I would do art and I would be able to go like to flea markets and so forth and sell my art and support myself that way. That was my idea. Well, rather than actually doing it, I wrote a story about it. And it started off when I was at College of Idaho, and I, it, it started off with a, couple, a bunch of boys telling stories at College of Idaho. <laughs> and then it got to be like 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, and so I put them in Los Feliz, and I put them in the industry. And so anyway, this, it, it's done. It's just, I'm still not sure that it's not just a piece of garbage, you know? You know how that is? You write something and you think, 
everybody's going to laugh at you and everybody's going to say... Why don't you let me read it and I'll tell you if it's oh, garbage Oh, okay. Or not. All right, I'll do that. I, my last tweak. Jennifer, ugh, this is garbage. Yeah, I even gave it to my friend Doug Knott and he gave it right back to me with nothing on it. Not, not even a period, not even a comma change. Well, then he liked it. But he didn't say anything. <laughs> I'm going to change the subject. Um, okay. Tell me about your adventures with this house and Eric Lloyd Wright. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Why in the world did I get started with the rights? Well, the whole thing was started because of the Ten Commandments and Ann Baxter being in the Ten Commandments. I went to Hollyhock House. Finally, my son was like 10 months old, and I took him on the tour. And he insisted on getting out of the pram. He s insisted on playing with the little things at the bottom of all the right doors and making noise. And the lady who was the docent there was like, mm. and I thought to myself, somebody has got to be a docent there who can stand to be around children because people are going to bring their kids in here, you know. And so, uh, you know, I felt like I was kind of didn't belong there because I had a little toddler, you know. So there was an announcement in the paper uh, about the Hollyhock House, and it said that if you wanted to, you could be a docent. Um, uh, just sign a call this number and called Virginia Kayser and you got on the list of people to be a docent. You had to take a 10 week class and at, at the end of the class um, they would have a party. Well the main reason I was interested in the Hollyhock House in the first place was I saw a picture of Frank Lloyd Wright with Ann Baxter of all people. Why were they together? I wanted to know. Was she a client of his? What was the deal? Somehow in reading Ann Baxter's biography I had missed that she was the granddaughter of Frank Lloyd Wright. So I didn't find out until after the 10-week class, and I had taken the whole thing, and we were at the party, and Virginia Cager says, oh, well, she's his granddaughter. Like that, like I should have known. So by that time, I had taken the whole class and everything, and Eric started, you know, showing up for these different events. There were things where you'd go to Malibu, and you'd hang out with Eric and, and, and all the other architects from the Taliesin Fellowship. And some of them were people that I knew, and some of them were people that when I got drunk, they were so much fun to talk to like John Reed. I mean, you could just go on and on with John Reed. And this other guy that uh, that Jim actually worked with, uh, Jim DeLong. And Jim DeLong tantalized me. He says, oh, I was, I was at Taliesin West one time when Ann Baxter was there, and, and she was having all these problems, and she took out, and, and she told me all this stuff, and it's like, I didn't get to hear what it was. So all of this was sort of the milieu. And we would go to look at how far Eric had gotten with his house. Eric has been building his house probably since 1970 out there. And it's an enormous, beautiful concrete house, completely fireproof, wonderful, unfinished, overlooking the ocean, overlooking Malibu. Oh, amazing. He lives in trailers. <laughs> so I started going out there, and I decided that that's who we wanted for our architect, if we ever, if we ever could do it. And we tried to buy the, build, the, the lot over there. Didn't work. Tried to buy the lot over there. And for some reason, it was up for sale. I think a Chinaman had bought it for... There, there's two Chinese people that own lots here. And the Chinese fellow had bought it... Three months. Okay. For uh, very cheap. He sold it to us for $80,000. And we just added it onto our mortgage. And that's why we have a big fat mortgage and a lot for Eric Wright to... If you, if you want to see the plans, I got them in the other room. That, that's up to you. What I'm going to do... We've got a couple of minutes left, right. and I'm going to change tapes. I talk so too much. It's, no, 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 we're going to change tapes, because I think this is all very interesting, and I want you to give us a tour of your street, so we can look right. at the, okay. the Lautner and the Moses and, and the, the different architects who've contributed to this very interesting, narrow <laughs> street. Right. So let's, um, we've still got three minutes if you want to uh, finish the story. Okay. Well, yeah, er, pick, Mar these are Mary Wright's paintings. Pick, oh, that's Mary Wright's painting. Pick a segue. Uh, that painting in the corner was done by Mary Wright. I actually still owe her for one of these paintings because every time I go there, I buy another one. Uh, tell us who Eric, uh, Mary, uh, Mary Wright, Wright is. Mary Wright is the wife of, of Eric, and they live uh, in these trailers, these wonderful organic blending with the land trailers in Malibu. Uh, they have 24 acres that was bought by Lloyd Wright, thinking he could bring all of his family together and they'd want to live there. And including Anais Nin, she went out there with Rupert and said, Oh, this is like the end of the world. It's too far from everything. She couldn't imagine living all the way out there in Malibu up 
And it is quite a ways up. It's about halfway up Payuma Road between Malibu Canyon Road and Rambla Pacifica. So it's very isolated. The only other person I know that's anywhere near that is Frank Lloyd Wright designed a house for Arch Obler of the Lights Out radio series. And his house is up there too. Let's stop here.